Our scripture was already read in your hearing from the prophet Malachi, the third verse, verses, uh, third chapter, verses six through 12. I am going to lift up from the 10th verse in your hearing again. Bring the full tide into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. Gracious and everlasting God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your prophet man, Malachi. We thank you, dear God, for the praises that have been lifted in your name already this morning, that you are our great Jehovah. Therefore, praise is what we shall do. And we do want to be the one God that will live in holiness and righteousness before your name. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, God, for you are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach to you from the sermon titled this morning, Put God to the Test. Put God to the test. On yesterday, we provided a workshop called Strengthening Stewardship. And in this, we learned that being good and responsible stewards over all that God gives to us is a biblical command by God to us. We learned that giving to God first is an act of trust and obedience. It was revealed that holding back from God that which he has freely given to us is a distortion of our thoughts orchestrated by the enemy. Poverty-based mindset does not freely give to God. And finally, we learn that managing God's resources given to us is grounded between our faith and under the authority of God all by himself. God raised up the prophet Malachi around 440 to 450 BC. Israel had returned from exile. They had repaired the walls of Jerusalem. They had rebuilt the temple that was destroyed. And now they were under the rule of Persia. And Malachi's message to the people centered around two key points. First, that Israel must remember and observe Old Testament law. And two, that Israel must remember and take hope in the coming Messiah. Israelites, upon their return from captivity, they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple. The priests were once again interceding on behalf of the people with God. But now about 65 years into their return and after all the work they had done, they began to fall back into their old ways of sin. But this time it was worse. The priesthood became corrupt, allowing the people to bring disease and defiled animal offerings before God. In Malachi chapter one, verse six and seven, Malachi says, it is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. Will anyone rob God? Then the people answered with the question, how are we robbing you? And God replied through the prophet Malachi, in your tithes and offering. I once heard a pastor preach this text and he called it every Sunday. There's a stick up in the sanctuary. Well, let us look at this concept of robbing God. Robbing implies that you are taking something from another that belongs to them. 
Robin implies an act of force or violence may be necessary to take what does not rightfully belong to you. And that which you rob, your intention is to keep it for yourself. When we rob God of the tithes, the time and the talents and the offering, here is what we are doing. The money we make belongs to God. The talents we have were given by God. And the time that is allotted to us is because of God. And you may say, wait a minute, I went to work. I worked hard for that money. So my pay, my salary is a reward for my hard work. And you are absolutely right. You work hard, therefore you deserve and earn your wages. But can I ask you a few questions? Who created you to work? Who blessed you with the talents needed to perform your job? Who wakes you up every day so you can get to work? Who watches over you to and from work? Who is maintaining your health so you, continue, so you can continue to work at your best? Who has provided the food that your wages can buy? Who has provided the clothing that your wages buy? Who has provided the ingenuity to build the shelter that is over your head right now? Your answer to these questions is really the one who your wages, your time, and your talents belong to. Unlike a robbery, God says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, on the first day of the week, each of you is to put aside something and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. I'm going to read that again from 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he or she may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. God says on the first day of the week, and for us in this calendar, that first day of the week is Sunday. On every Sunday, you ought to put something aside, store something away so that you may prosper. Every Sunday, you are to put something away for God and something away for yourself. Yesterday, Sister Deonce told us off the top, give 10% for God, and then give yourself 10 to 20%. So what's left over is 70 to 80% to spend on your needs and wants. I'm going to say that again. Off the top, give 10% to God. Then give 10 to 20% to yourself. Then you are left with 70 to 80% to spend on your needs and wants. Every Sunday, we are presented with a week consisting of 168 hours. 10% of your time, that would be 16.8 hours. Give to God by assembling with the saints, going to Bible study, giving your gifts to a ministry, coming to a worship service, coming and fellowship in one with the other. And after you have given 16.8 hours to God, you have over 151 hours left for your own work and your pleasure. Yet many of us choose to rob God of his tithes, of our time and of our talents. And like Israel, we don't even realize what we are doing, which is really the real offense to God. When Malachi said and told them, will you rob God? Their response is, 
How are we robbing God? How are we holding back from God? You see, when we know we are not doing what God has commanded us to do, we fall into what Sister Maria said yesterday, a habitual pattern of thinking, <clears throat> which is the beginning of creating strongholds. Giving and financial management are spiritual issues, not financial issues. Because in Luke 16, 11, it says, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? If you cannot be faithful to God in the wealth that the world is giving you, how can he trust you with the true riches, which is stored up for you in the heavenly realm? we enter a mindset of what's called denial, that by holding back from God, it's okay. And we justify it with these habitual patterns of thoughts. I got bills to pay. My job comes first before the church. I need to put money aside for emergencies. They should be grateful I gave them something. My tithe is enough. They don't need my time and talents as well. How little can I give and still please God? God's response to this is, according to verse nine of our text this morning, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And what is that curse? Being persistently living life with a poverty-minded mindset and accepting a life of mediocrity. What is the curse? Having a persistent poverty-minded mindset and living and being content with a life of mediocrity. According to Luke 6 and 13, no servant can serve two masters for either he or she will hate the one and love the other, or he or she will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And the real sin in all of this is that you do not trust the God that provides. God even told my, my Malachi to tell them, bring the full tide into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing best, best blessing. Try me. God says, and see what happens in your life when you try me, when you test me, when you put me to the test. See what happens when you absolutely trust me, put me to the test, put my words to the test, put my promises to the test, put my actions to the test. Because in the beginning, of our passage of scripture, God reminded us of one thing. He said in verse six, for I, the Lord, do not change. What does that mean? God says, I don't change. Whatever I tell you, I stand on it. Whatever I say I can do for you, I stand on it. If I say I love you, I love you. If I say you cannot be separated from the love of my son, you cannot be separated from the love of God. God does not change, but he created a people who are ever changing and fickle in their ways. But he says, you know what? I still, if you test me, if you trust me with your tide and your time and your talents, he says, you are living under an open heaven. Can you imagine that? 
that there is a place where God will open up. And if you put him to the test, meaning if you trust him, if you hold on to his unchanging hand, if you believe in the God that does not change, that is not fickle, a God whose yes is yes and his no is no, and there's no lukewarm in between. He says, there's a heaven that can open up. And when I open up that heaven, I will pour out for you and pour down on you an overflowing that blessing so much that you won't have room enough to contain it. Can I tell you, this is why we cannot be content with lives of mediocrity. Because if you trust God and obey God with your time, your tithes, and your talents, what his word is saying to you, what you are putting to the test is can he do it? Will he do it? And as a people, one of our favorite phases is won't he do it? And what Malachi was telling Israel, if you just return back to God, if you just respect and revere God enough that you're not giving him leftovers, that if you're not giving him the worst of your crop, that you're giving your world the best and saving the mediocre rest for God, what he is saying, if you will just return to me, God says, I will return to you. I will bless you. I will stand for you. I will protect you. When you delight in me, when you satisfy me, I will show you an open heaven. When you commit to me, I will pour out that blessing for you. And I will pour it down so much that you can't even begin to conceive it. Many of you did the spiritual gift assessment not too long ago. And you identify three talents, three gifts that God has given you. But what you realize were, there were a whole lot of other gifts that's still sitting there for him to manifest in your life. But if you live life acting like you don't know, that you don't understand, what his command is to you in giving of yourself, in giving of your time, in giving of your tithe. If you want to be dense like Israel, talk about, well, what did we do? How did we defile you, God? How are we robbing you? It's like, did they really not know or were they being sarcastic with God? Well, here's what I'm going to say. Don't you be sarcastic with God because he says it, I will curse you. And what that means is, and Sister Deonce talked about it yesterday, she phrased it as having near dying almost every day. You always got some kind of near death going on. And she clarified it to say she wasn't talking about a physical death, but she was like, you always got some kind of drama going on in your life. You always got something creeping up that don't have you sleeping at night, got you pacing the floor. You can't even eat to strengthen your body because some drama is going on. And what that is, is an imbalance. And every presenter yesterday said, when that occurs, when you are always in a Peter, Robin Peter to pay Paul kind of living, when you are always concerned about where you're going to get this next and where you're going to get that next and how can I go spend two hours at the church? Oh my God, they want me to go to an afternoon service. Are you kidding me? When you are always in a state of distress over your time, your talents, and your tide, which is your money, amen, there is an imbalance. And the imbalance is in your relationship to God. It's not an imbalance with your money. It's not an imbalance with your time. It is an imbalance with your relationship to God. And what is out of balance is that you don't 
fully trust God. But this morning, God says, just God is, he's like, he's like waiting, you know? And he's like, just put me to the test. Come on, y'all. Just put me to the test. Just anything that's going on in your life, put me to the test. And yesterday we learned about the I will and the I can statements. We got to stop having if statements in our lives. And we have to have statements of confidence that says, I will, what I will overcome. What can I do? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, I will and I can. That's the turning point. Because when you begin to leave that poverty-minded mindset, one of the things that, that, that Sister Deontay said that blew my mind is when she was looking for quotes about finances and money. It was hard for her to find a quote from an African-American that didn't have to do with money and struggle. That blew my mind. That blew my mind. She said she had to search and search and she found a quote by one woman, one African-American sister that had something to say about finances and money that was not attached to struggle that was not attached to a poverty mindset. So on this day, I am here to tell you, put God to the test. Let God retake control of your mind. Let him remind you that you were created and made for wealth, wealth in your health, wealth in your home, wealth in your body, wealth in your children. We're not just talking about money today. We're talking about everything that God gives you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about stopping the denial statements, the justification statements that you could do the littlest for God and then sit back with your vain self and want God to do all kinds of miracles and wonder working power movements in your life, but you done filled your head with a justification that they should be glad with what I am given. It's not me. It's not me who has to be glad. It's not Calvary Fellowship who has to be glad. It's not your brothers and sisters in Christ who has to be glad. It is God who has to be well pleased. It is God who has to understand and the one that you need to satisfy and delight and commit yourself to. It don't have not remove me as your pastor and remove Calvary Fellowship as your church because the imbalance is not with your church. The imbalance is with your relationship with God. But there's an open heaven. And you know what it's activated by? It's activated by a sober mind. It's activated by love for God. It's activated by the power that you put into the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can move and intercede on your behalf such that you can move through this life. I tell people all the time, and they, you know, they always question me. And it's not because of my profession. It's not because of my degrees. I do not worry. I do not worry. I don't worry about money. I don't worry about my time. And I don't worry about my gifts. And I have understood. And I am a living witness in front of this little Zoom screen of you today. That when worry is completely removed from your life, that is the best thing you can give to God. Because what you're saying to God is, hey, I'm putting you to the test. I'm in your hands. I'm trying you. I am with you. I'm in your powerful, righteous right hand. Do with me as you will. Guide me as you will. And all I'm going to do, Lord, is commit my time, my talents, and my tithes to you. And you know what, folks? I live a peaceful life. I live a contented life. Do I have drama every now and then? It's really far and few. But even when the drama comes, the Holy Spirit is like my little force shield and it just bounces right off because I completely am sold out and loyal to my Lord and Savior. We say it all the time. Where would we be 
Well, think about it. Where would you be without God in your life? Just sit with that a minute. Percolate and marinate on that a minute. Where would you be without God in your life? And that thought alone should make you want to be sold out for God. So much, so much that God has for you. But we don't want to be like Israel when Malachi was raised up. Because you know what ended up happening? They didn't listen. And they were about, they kept doing what they were doing. But thanks be to God that he bailed them out with a savior. He bailed them out with the cry of Jesus Christ on a mountaintop. He bailed them out of their sins with an old rugged cross. That's the test put him to the test. And when they put God to the test, God came down himself. When they put God to the test, he came and he walked and talked about righteousness and holiness and obedience to his father in heaven. When they put God to the test, when they mocked him and lied about him, he didn't say a mumbling word. When they put God to the test with their inhumanity and inhumane treatment of him, he still went to the cross. When they put God to the test, he gave up his life. He gave up the Holy Ghost. When they put God to the test, he allowed them to bury him in an old borrowed tomb. When they put God to the test, he stayed in that tomb all day Friday night, all day Saturday. And then when the final grade came, he rose up on Sunday morning, and he passed the ultimate test, which was victory over death, victory over death. And that is what God is saying to you this morning. Put me to the test in your life. If you don't have faith in yourself, if you don't have faith in your gifts, if you don't have faith in your money, if you confused about your time all the time, showing up late when you know you should be 10 minutes early, if doing things that you know you shouldn't be spending time on or giving it too much time, you will give the world a 16 hour shift and complain about giving God two hours on a Sunday morning. Have mercy upon us, merc merciful Father for provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We say that every first Sunday, put God to the test. And can I tell you something you already know? He will pass each and every one of it. We may fail, but he's going to pass. So on this morning, don't be like the Israelites. Don't act dumb. Don't justify it. Just return to God. And he says, I will return to you. And when he returns to you, he's going to open up heaven and pour out an overflowing blessing such that you won't have room enough. And I don't know about you. And I preached about this before. I want an overflow God. I want the God of the overflow in my life. I want the God of the overflow in your life. So on this morning, it's okay. Go ahead and put God to the test. Amen.